Heyo, welcome everyone to episode 77 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and I just want to say thank you for checking us out. If you like what we're doing here, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. We're going to dive into art this week, something that we don't do too much. We did 20, 30 episodes back with Throwback Highlight Heroes, and we're actually going to have Karis back on to talk today. Karis works at Unity. She just told me recently that she was working there at the time, but didn't want to announce it yet. So we're going to announce it now. And she did work on Throwback Highlight Heroes, which is still kind of in development, but we'll be seeing more of it soon, I'm sure. So I guess we're going to bring Karis on right now. How you doing? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad you were able to get on here. And I'm I'm really excited to talk to you about art because I know you are pretty versed in it as well as you know the programming side of game development a little bit too, which usually sees someone that knows one or the other, not so much always both. So we'll just jump right into who you are. So just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then tell us one of your earliest video game memories. Oh, cute. Okay. Um, so my name is Karis. I am a technical artist, and that means... <laughs> I'm technically an artist. God, I keep doing that. Anyway, um, being a technical artist is a uh, is a unique is a unique position to be in in the industry um, because a technical artist is a, uh, a it's a it's a role that's defined in a number of different ways depending on who you talk to. Uh, we can talk about some of that here. Looking specifically at the art side. I am able to model and texture and do materials and shaders, as well as integrate those things into the game, uh, as well as you know rigging and animation. It, it's kind of the person that uh, is able to be the glue between two different groups. Um, and those groups are typically more art focused and more technically focused people. So you might have your art team and your programming team and you have your technical artists in the center creating tools to get those things integrated into the game, or you have your technical artist uh, creating the rigs and setup for animation to allow the artists to create animations. And, or perhaps you have the te technical artist in improving and integrating and optimizing, you know, whether it's uh, frame rate or materials and shaders. Um, kind of get the idea. The technical artist stands in between two groups of people and is able to do a little bit of both to prevent any friction and allow for a seamless um, integration of art assets into the, the engine. Um, so that's what I do. And I focus on um, a little bit of everything, I guess a little bit of everything I just described. Um, but you definitely will in the industry have your more shader focused technical artists, your setup for animation focused technical artists, your pipeline tool set creation and uh, technical artists. Um, and yeah, there's just, they come in all shapes and sizes, um, but technical artists is a great umbrella term that describes everything. Um, I am a more traditionally focused technical artist. Uh, for instance, I came from an art background a lot of times you'll find TAs that have a more technical background, such as being a programmer first and then getting into the art side. Uh, you, you do find a little bit of both. So me personally, I started out as an artist. Um, I went to school for game art at Full Sail University. Um, I graduated as a character artist and I immediately moved on into the world of innovation and non-games technical art. Um, there's a whole journey there that I could talk about, but um, I'm very happy to be where I am. I really love my job. I really love being an artist, and I love working on games in my, my hobby time because um, that's where I really feel like I can uh, express myself and express uh, who I am as an artist and who I want to be as an artist. So, yeah, um, that's a little bit about me as an artist. Oh, and I have a... Uh, caricature small business. Um, I do traditional art as a caricature artist. When I was a little girl, I wanted to be a street artist. Um, I told my parents that, and I think maybe it wasn't my parents, but somebody said, uh, aim higher. <laughs> I wanted to be that person on the side of the road that drew people for a living. For just, I just wanted to make people happy, you know? Um, I really live for that experience where you draw somebody and then you flip it over and you see the 
emotion explode on their face. So um, I really wanted to do that. So I get to do that now. I have a, a small business doing live event caricature um, for you know business parties and weddings and you know uh, whatever they might hire me for. So um, I had a, a small stint as a Twitch streamer doing that, uh, raising money for charity, and that was super fun. I think I might pick that up again. But um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. My first video game memory, um, I remember Descent on the DOS. Uh, my dad even gave me my first gamer tag. He said, hey, you need a new name if you're going to be playing this game. you got to have like a call sign. Um, so uh, my cat's name was Jasmine. And my, my middle name's Elizabeth. So my first gamer tag was Jazzy Beth. I must have been like five, but I was sitting there and playing... Uh, Descent on the DOS with my dad. That was definitely my first gaming memory. Sounds like fun, a good way to get started in gaming. You said you started as an artist, you kind of did all these things in between, moved from traditional art caricatures into video game art. Mm -hmm. Since you've already done it, I think you're a good person to ask, how did you transition? Like, what is the best way for a traditional artist to transition into the game development space? Best way for a traditional artist to transition. Well, there's definitely, it, it depends on, you know, how you want to go about it. There will be some education that's required to get into um, the skill sets that you need to be a 3D artist. Even if you don't want to be a 3D artist, even if you want to be a 2D game artist, there are a lot of engine specific constraints that you need to understand and learn that you will also learn as a 3D artist. So I recommend anybody who wants to specifically be a pixel artist, I would recommend that person also understand the 3D space and learn from that perspective. And that would require education. Um, you can go about it on your own. You can learn Blender, which is a free 3D program. Um, but you know there are some more powerful tools in the industry that a more formal education can give you. Um, and I would definitely recommend going through the gauntlet of education to get you to where you want to be. It's, it's not so much that you wouldn't be able to learn it from, um, from your home. It's just there's so much to learn that it might be best if it's kind of, you know, provided to you and tested and graded and that kind of thing. If, if you wanted to go about it on your own, um, there are a lot of really good options for um, uh, online education. But overall, I would definitely recommend finding an education uh, to to teach you those 3D art skills that you would need to be a, a game artist. But if you've done all that and you're still left wondering how do I become a game artist, I definitely recommend education as the first step into your journey as a game artist. So when it comes to transitioning from somebody who works with a symbol system to somebody who is able to uh, record real life with their pencil. There was a really significant moment that happened for me, which was when I was like 10, my uncle uh, gave me a book for my birthday. And it was Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by Betty Edwards. Um, and he told me, and my uncle was a very skilled artist, still is. Um, and I always admired his artwork. He, would, he could do graphite and charcoal and things like that. And he did a really great job of representing the real world on paper and uh, with, with a lot of detail and a lot of finesse showing like light on, on a subject and um, the, the, like the depth of real life and that kind of thing. He told me if I read this book that I could be an artist like him. And that just blew my mind. Um, so I still thank my uncle to this day for that opportunity because I read that book every year of my life until it finally clicked for me. And what I mean by that is I did my best reading through it as a 10-year-old. I did my best reading through it as an 11-year-old. And then finally, when I was 12, it kind of just went, oh, okay. And what I, what I figured out at, at 12 years old was that um, this book was not teaching me, and it says this explicitly, but it finally made sense to me. The, the book was not teaching you how to draw. If you can sign your name, you can draw. This book was teaching you how to see how to interpret the world correctly through your eyes, because most of the artwork happens in your eyes first. 
the processing needs to happen in your brain, and then it gets recorded with your hands. Because um, you can you can draw with any instrument. Um, you can use any part of your body to draw, right? Um, you know, I could maybe not as as maybe not the same, but I could use my left hand in particular. I'm I'm right-handed person. Um, I could use my feet um, to to draw. The point is that the processing happens in your brain, um, and there's a cognitive shift that happens from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. And I know that a lot of the uh, left brain, right brain uh, research has been debunked, but there is a uh, there is a truthfulness in the way that we have certain processing pieces in our left hemisphere and certain processing pieces in our right hemisphere. Um, and if we are able to shut out the part of the brain that controls the, the pattern of speech and the self-doubt and whatever, and we go into this flow state of the right side that allows us to lose sense of time and the colors get brighter and the light brights get brighter and the darks get darker and we're only interpreting the world as a, a canvas for our eyes to receive and our hands to record. That is, that is the place we want to be when we start developing our art skills. So yeah, I recommend reading that book. If I can give a little like, I think it's available for free as a PDF online. Um, and if it's not, it's, there's like an audio book or something. And it's probably available at your local library. But you might be intrigued if you Googled drawing on the right side of the brain before and after, because this book is a collection from Betty Edwards' um, course that she taught for multiple for, for many, many years. And she recorded it all into this book. And she included before and afters of her students' work because she would ask them to do a self-portrait at the beginning and a self-portrait at the end. And the, uh, the difference between the self-portraits before and after her course were astounding, enough to really, really pique my interest as a 10-year-old and be like, I want to do that. <laughs> how do I do that? And it's kind of funny how, how things worked out. Um, so yeah, um, if you would like to become an artist, anyone can become an artist. There, I want to debunk any idea of like, you, you don't have a talent or you don't have a gift or you don't have a skill. A uh, art skill is a trainable skill set, just like any other skill set. Um, so if anyone has ever told you that you can't, I'm giving you permission now that you can. All you have to do is put in the time and the effort uh, and have the interest to move forward with it. So um, yeah, go, go forth and be an artist. I think that's good advice to get you on your way, get you started and kind of help you get to that area that you want to get to. You kind of mentioned it before you were talking about 3D art, pixel art. What are the pros and cons of each style for video game art? And I guess, which one do you kind of lean more towards yourself? Let's see. Um, pros and cons of each one. Now, it's it's easy to look at any simplified game style, game art style, and say, oh, that looks easier. Or you might, you know, gravitate toward low poly because it looks easier. You might gravitate toward pixel art because it looks easier. It has different constraints and different problems and different difficulties. You're going to have to play by a different set of rules when you put yourself in a, in a box. Because what we're doing when we when we replicate the older constraints of those time periods is what we're doing. We're going, so we're stepping back in time and pretending that our computers can't run as high poly as we can now, or we can't run as you know high resolution as we can now. So we have to operate within those limitations. And when we artificially create those limitations, there's a lot of nuance a lot of new problems that need to be solved. It's just different. It's not any less difficult. It's just different. It's a different kind of hard. When working on a 3D game, you are going to have similar limitations. Um, and you might even say that it is a different kind of hard, but less friction throughout the entire process. Because 
you're kind of going in the direction of current innovation. Therefore, you get to find new things and you get to discover new things and add new things. And you don't have to worry about if you're breaking the immersion of the, um, the older generation's constraints, you know, the, the SNES constraints, the, the Atari constraints, the Game Boy constraints. Yeah, the pros and cons. I, I definitely enjoy creating both. Which one do I gravitate toward? Now, I, when I was younger, uh, I think I talked on the last podcast about Jazz Jackrabbit. Um, I used to go into MS Paint and create Jazz Jackrabbit sprites because I wanted to like create the ending that I wanted to see um, of, of Jazz Jackrabbit. And um, <laughs> I used to also do like pixel art Disney princesses and a bunch of stuff and it was fun for me. And I, I just continued to do that because I was replicating what I saw on the screen in Microsoft Paint. I, because of that, I always wanted to work with pixel art. Um, in, in my previous position at Full Sail University, um, I was a studio artist. And part of my role was to create art for games. And I was creating art from like between one and 10 games per month. Um, and on a, on a production cycle of one month per game or two months per game. And that created an opportunity for me to constantly be creating. Um, and I got a lot of experience under my belt during that time. And so I, I very much learned how important it is to not worry about the style, but just listen to the client at that point, <laughs> what they prefer, and also look at the, um, the opportunity that the mechanics are bringing you. If the mechanics are giving you a constraint, you have to work with it and not against it. Um, if you have to keep your character you know, one unit tall so that they can fit um, under the obstacles and the puzzles that they've created. You know, you have to keep your character within one unit so that, you know, none of the animations or anything go outside of that. I mean, the, the, the effects and the animations and maybe some, you know, uh, uh, feathers or a ponytail or something can go outside of that, right? And so that you have to think about what kind of opportunities you're being given with your constraints. Ultimate question was what do I gravitate towards? I still think I gravitate towards pixel art because it's my favorite. Um, so I I would be I would sooner sit down in my free time and create pixel art than I would sit down and create a full 3D character model. So I think that's the answer. I like that. I think that's that's cool. I mean, you go back to like your roots with it and talking about the restraints is it's a really good point. I mean, I I didn't even really think about it because. And it's just, it's something that's easily overlooked by somebody that one, isn't an artist and two, just like, if you don't know the development side too, then you're, you're missing half of the picture of the game, you know? Yeah. I, I know plenty of artists that will design something amazing and then expect a game to happen from it. Um, and really the best games come from listening to the developers, understanding their design, and then creating something within what they've already created that marries it perfectly. And that is something I really enjoy about what I do is, is creating an opportunity for something really cool without providing friction on the other side. Um, yeah, th th there's often a, a friction point between the two disciplines where, you know, the artist has something really cool, the developer has something really cool, and then there's, there's no glue. It's just, well, I want what I want, and I want what I want. And then, you know, you can imagine, right? Well, that's where you come in. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what you do. I guess uh, a question that might be interesting to people that are kind of on the, like that want to develop, but don't know which route to go is what are some of the major differences for artists between an indie studio and a AAA studio? It's a great question. Um, I uh, have noticed some differences between um, roles and responsibilities between the different, uh, the different environments for an artist to be in. So, Let's say that you want to work on your biggest, most favorite game, um, and you you get an opportunity and you're there. You might be working on one part of one part of one game for a very, very long time. And what I mean by that is, you know, you might be creating one piece of one type of asset over and over and over and over again. And 
that might be like the best job ever for you. Depends on who you are, right? If, if you love that. Um, you're, or you're going to be animating the same uh, character, right, um, for, for the entire life cycle of the, of the game, roles that you can fall into. And you have probably decided this before you've gotten into a position where you're looking for a job. But a, um, in the AAA industry, you know, you're either creating environments, you're creating props, or you're creating characters and uh, as a modeler. If the AAA studio is as large as we're imagining, you would be working on a very small piece of one project for a very long time and contributing to something much larger. Whereas if you're in an indie game, you know, those teams are typically much smaller and you would probably have more say in the end result, the design, the look and feel of the project because you would be able to influence those things. Uh, you would be doing more work. You have to do everything. If something doesn't get done, it just doesn't get done. There's nobody else to to, to pick that up for you. So uh, depending on the, the, the game that's being made in an indie studio, you probably have one or two people per discipline within a team. And if you're in an art team, you know, you can work collaboratively with those people and then largely influence the end result and be able to create something that ideally everybody agrees on, but you know, you would be responsible for everything or a large majority of everything, depending on what your particular role is. Yeah, it's just as a matter of manpower, you know, with uh, AAA industry, AAA studio, they're going to have divisions and divisions within divisions and, you know, small teams within divisions. And with an indie game, you're, you're not going to have that. You're just going to have a small group of people that have a dream and um, trying to do their best to, to make it happen. So, yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it. I mean, people look at AAA games and they know there are tons and tons of people involved, but they don't really realize how those people are all grouped up and compartmentalized to make the final product happen. Yeah. And it's a lot. It, it's pretty crazy that there's that, yeah. that many and they spend so many years working on it. So that's a pretty big distinction between the two of them. And mm -hmm. as an artist yourself, what is the importance of developing your own art style or how do you develop your own art style? That's a really great question. I, I, I do get that question a lot. And I remember being a young artist wanting to know the answer to that question the most. <laughs> like looking at these artists that I admire and trying to figure out like, well, how did they do that? How did they get, like, I can recognize their artwork. How did they get to a point where I can recognize their artwork? How would someone be able to recognize my artwork? What's my style? And I think that that's just a thing that, you know, really like occupies a young artist's mind. So if you're listening and you're wondering the same thing, Here's my answer from a perspective of somebody who decidedly stopped caring about it and then it happened anyway. I think that is what needs to happen. If you stop stressing out about your style, because your style is, is a result of everything that influenced you on your journey to get where you are coming together and being picked up in a way that is nuanced, right? You know, it's the way that you hold your pen. It's the pressure that you use while you're holding it. It's it's the um, it's the looseness of your shoulder. It's the um, it's the flick of your wrist. I'm not even joking. Like it, it's just, who, however you are that day, that is what gets influenced into your style. It's it's who you studied. It's how you studied. It's it's the, how you felt that day. Everything comes together into to your style and. That's why art is so expressive. That's why it's so special. I mean, I, I'm aware that if you are trying to develop your style and you want to get to a certain end point, um, like maybe you want to look like a particular artist, maybe you love a particular show and you want to draw like that all the time. Um, if you don't go through the ropes of creating the foundation of skills that will get you to where you need to be, let's say it's a cartoon show, those people are artistic interpretations of an, of the real world through someone else's lens. If you're then viewing that from your lens and then doing your inter interpretation of them, um, they're not going to look as 
appealing as that artist's work does. So what I'm saying is, if you were to do nothing but look at someone else's art and try to copy it, you could get really good at copying someone else's style, but you won't be able to, to expand past that. So there, there's this concept of uh, a symbol system that when we were young, part of what our brain is designed to do is to create a symbol system to be able to interpret the world around us and represent symbols. And, and we can grow past that, but what our, uh, when we look at someone else's art and copy it directly or get influenced from it directly, it turns into a very complex symbol system that we're creating for ourselves. Whereas the, the, the better road that we could take is drawing from real life and doing, you know, the, the academic less fun, you know, drawings of fruit in a bowl on a table and flowers in a vase and that kind of thing just to train our eye to the point that we can then draw from real life and then interpret our own and get back. What, what those artists have done is they've taken the real world, they've interpreted it through their lens and then turned it back into a symbol system to appeal to the younger audience, to appeal to the younger um, person inside of all of us. I think it's so beautiful. But if we, if we take their interpretation of real world and then we copy it directly it's going to be viewed through a double lens and it's not going to be as appealing um, as as it was interpreted through your lens and then given to the world as an offering there's a lot more to say about that i think i'll stop <laughs> i think that was a great great way to put it i mean it's just it's the way you see the world everybody has their own perspective and you only mm -hmm. see from your own perspective so if mm -hmm. you can share your perspective with somebody else that is your style yeah Oh, and there's more about um, game-specific style. Um, if you wanted to start your own style for a game, um, uh, I would say, like, I, I've been on this podcast before, and I was quoted saying about the, the color palette and the sentence that we use. But basically, whenever, you, whenever I start a game, I try to... Uh, pick something based off of the information that I've gathered from the client, from the, from the developers, from um, whomever, and then stick to whatever we decide. And I'll typically use a feeling, um, an inspiration, like an influence, a feeling, an influ influence, and a visual reference. Um, so we have, you know, emotion, we have a uh, feeling, and then we have um, visual reference to go by um, and then from that create a color palette and then keep that color palette consistent just five colors but keep it very nuanced um, if you go beyond five it gets very muddy very quickly now you can go outside of five but they need to be they need to live in the family of five that you started with um, if you know what I mean you can't you can't go against the, the five um, so yeah that that's how I start any game and define a style. And I try to go outside of my comfort zone whenever I start a new one, um, try to do something new, something unique, something that's never been done before. Like maybe I'll just pick two colors, you know? Um, maybe I'll pick conflicting imagery. Maybe, you know, I, I, that's, that's where the fun comes in. It's like, oh, it's this, but it's got this tone or it's um, set in this time period, but it's got this subject matter. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of how I go about it. I like that. It, that's a, a good way to take the inspiration of the game and like keep it consistent through the art style as you continue mm -hmm. going. Um, I guess the last thing that I wanted to ask you, and this one's kind of a surprise to you, give us an update on Throwback Highlight Heroes. What have you guys <laughs> been working on? Where have you guys shown it? Like, what has been going on with the game since we last spoke? Oh boy. Okay. Um, so we showed uh, CEO and we showed at Free Play Florida. Um, so shout out to those teams. They really, really did the most helping us out in those ways. And we started to make some progress in directions that will, um, you know, will come to fruition shortly. So if you're interested, Keep an eye on the horizon and we'll see where that goes. I love it. Short and sweet, giving the tease, but you can't let anybody know it's really coming. 
Um, I guess that's all the questions I had for you, Karis. So to wrap okay. everything up, just give us social media links so they can check you out, uh, the game, mm -hmm. if they want to check out the game, and that'll be it. Cool. So I have Instagram at Karis.Captures. I have Twitter at Karis Frazier for more of my professional content. Um, I have um, the video game would be at Astro Pro Games for most things. The game, of course, is Throwback Highlight Heroes. Um, I think we've gotten to the point where you can Google Highlight and our game comes up, so I think it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, that's, just, that's what we got. Awesome. I'm going to throw all those links down in the description so you guys can check them out. Uh, thank you for coming on, Karis. I really appreciate you coming on and giving us the perspective from somebody that's in the industry a little bit more about the art space. Um, and that's everything we got this week. So if you like what we're doing at Indie Arcade Wave, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, Peace. Bye.